Um, we are uh, excited to have our next speaker coming up today. Uh, we have a physical therapist, Toby Schapp. Toby received her uh, bachelor's in biology. Oops, I'm sorry, has received her bachelor's in biology from Linfield College in Oregon and her doctorate degree in physical therapy in 2001 from Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. She's a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist and currently works as the clinical supervisor at Spalding Outpatient Clinic outside of Boston. Over the past 20 years as a physical therapist, Toby has been involved in treating a variety of patients focusing primar primarily on adult and adolescent orthopedics. Her experiences also include unique opportunities in early intervention pediatrics, as well as working seven years as a civilian physical therapist for the U.S. Army in Fort Stewart, Georgia. More recently, her clinical interests include specialties of pelvic health, advanced OB pregnancy and postpartum care, women's health care, and sports and orthopedic rehabilitation. Please join me today in welcoming Toby Shep. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, that means I don't have to go through much of my bio, but uh, I'm new to the community. I just wanted to say thank you for the invite. Um, like she said, I worked 20 years. I've been worked 20 years as a physical therapist. And um, my time when I was working as a civilian PT for the US Army, I was working with some pretty amazing soldier athletes who that's where I gained my experience with rhabdomyolysis, although it was exertional rhabdomyolysis. So a little bit of a different beast than what we may be talking about here. Um, but currently, I work in, outside of Mo, uh, Boston with the MGB Mass General Brigham um, Spalding Physical Therapy Group. And that's where I ran into a patient with a very long chain fatty acid disorder. And she's the one who asked me to, to speak today. So I do appreciate um, the invitation. When I first started uh, with her, she told me that a lot of people in your network um, almost fear exercise and physical therapy due to the fact of the scariness of uh, rhabdomyolysis. So I wanted to speak today about that. Um, some people don't even really know what a physical therapist is. So I, I just briefly wanted to talk about uh, what a PT is. PTs are physical therapists or movement experts. Um, we strive to improve the quality of life through prescribed exercise. We do hands-on manual therapy care, patient education. Um, we, we diagnose and treat patients with injuries or post-surgical conditions or disabilities or health conditions that need treatment. We also can just treat people who simply want to become healthier, healthier uh, prevent future problems. And the ultimate um, goal is that we are going to individually examine and um, create a treatment plan for patients to improve their movement and strength, reduce or manage their pain and restore function and ultimately prevent any other disabilities. Um, why do patients come see physical therapists? Well, that's kind of an interesting thought because initially you might think you only need to see a physical therapist if you have a direct result of a chronic condition say you have a stroke and you have muscle weakness and we're going to address that, um, arthritis pain, that type of thing. But we also treat an impairment um, that may be completely independent of the chronic conditions. So I treat a ton of back and neck pain or ankle pain or post-surgical pain. Everybody gets injuries despite whether the fact they have a chronic condition or not. And so oftentimes we're treating an ankle, but we also, if somebody has a chronic condition that we have to keep that information in the back of our mind is how we treat that patient. Ultimately our goal, regardless of the reason that you come to us is to improve your health, general health, functional abilities and quality of life. So as we see through this presentation, what I hope to show is that um, the benefits of physical activity are important to everybody, but especially even maybe more so people with chronic conditions, because you're already at a compromised um, general health just due to your condition. So the benefits of being active can counteract and prevent some of the really negative effects of not being healthy, like heart disease or obesity, or diabetes, other subsequent issues unrelated to your condition. And the general consensus of evidence has shown that regular physical activity provides important health benefits to the, your cardiovascular health, your muscle fitness and brain health, 
and the ability to perform everyday activities, your daily life, your quality of life is better. And as a physical therapist, that's our main goal is to promote that regular physical activity and make it part of your lifestyle. So the CDC and the American College of Sports Medicine puts out guidelines every couple of years about how much activity is considered enough activity to be healthy. Um, for a normal, quote unquote, normal adult, uh, guidelines for uh, physical activity for exercise are moderate intensity aerobic activities that get your heart beating for 150 minutes to 300 minutes a week with two days of muscle strengthening activities. They also say that you can do that as 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous activity a week. That sounds like a lot, possibly, but if you think, if you would like to be a, live a healthy lifestyle and you're gonna exercise maybe four or five days a week, if you divide 150 minutes um, by five, that's only 30 minutes a day, so it's completely manageable. Now the guidelines change a little bit for children. Um, when a, when a child is in preschooling age, you don't want to say you need to go exercise. What they just need to be is they have to have um, daily physical activity. They encourage just simple, normal activities that promote movements such as cardio movements and strengthening and balancing and climbing. And just being a kid, having that opportunity to be a kid is enough for uh, preschool age children to get to be healthy. Once the kids reach adolescence, six to 17, they increase the uh, recommendations to an hour of moderate to vigorous activity a week, I mean, uh, daily. So that's actually being quite active. They, they also want you to include muscle strengthening activities three days a week and bone strengthening activities three days a week. So the interesting thing about children's and adolescents is you have to remember that they're still growing. Actually, their bodies are moving and growing and developing uh, you know, at a significant rate during these age, this age. Their bone growth and their muscle growth depends on that input of exercise, but you don't wanna over-exercise because their, um, like their, their growth plates aren't quite developed and you don't wanna overdo the things. But the good thing about encouraging this much activity in children and adolescents is that it helps develop healthy habits that continue into an adulthood. So that's great for all considered normal adults and children, but what happens when somebody has a chronic health condition? Well, the CDC and the American College of Sports Medicine have, it's quite interesting actually, the guidelines don't significantly change. If you are considered a person with a, a chronic health condition, they still recommend 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. This is actually the what I would recommend for this population of um, people with mitochondrial and fatty acid disorders. Um, again, there's that caveat if you're doing something more vigorous, you could do it for less time. Professionally, I would kind of, you know, limit, not recommend long duration of vigorous intensity exercises. Um, for this population, and we're gonna talk about that in a bit. But if you're doing a little bit of it, it's fine. The really important is you are unable to meet the guidelines due to your disability or chronic health condition, you should still engage in regular physical activity, but do it under the care of a healthcare provider. So I would say that you should find you know, your physician or um, ask for a physical therapy consult and work to, and they will work together to help make sure that you're doing what you should be doing for your body. But most interestingly, they say you need to avoid inactivity um, within reason. Obviously, if you're having a bad rhabdo um, episode or something else is going on, you don't want to really exercise during that time. But in the general scheme of things, inactivity causes more damage than um, not than you want. So. We're going to do. I know I've been I've been able to listen to some of the other physicians and and exercise science people talking this weekend, and they've have some great information. So a lot of this is going to be repeat, and hopefully, um, we'll just skim over some of these uh, some of the the science behind the exercise that we're going to talk about. Um, and just as a review, because sometimes there's a lot you're you're taking it in like a fire hose this weekend. There's a lot of information, so repetition is always good. But uh, aerobic exercise, so we're gonna talk about the different types of, of exercise. Aerobic exercise, things like cycling and dancing and hiking, swimming, walking. It's an exercise that 
relies on some of your slow twitch muscles more so than your fast twitch muscles. But most importantly, it relies on aerobic metabolism to gain energy to do the activity. Um, anaerobic exercise, on the other hand, is more of that intense, short duration, very powerful, fast twitch muscle activity where you're sprinting, you're doing high intensity interval training, which is CrossFit type of activities. You're power lifting. You're, you know, you're really exploding out of whatever your whatever activity you're doing. The interesting thing about this, it's an important type of exercise because it does help build um, muscle strength, but it is fueled by energy sources primarily out of the contracting muscles, independent of the use of oxygen as its energy source. And because of that, it produces less ATP and it can lead to the buildup of lactic acid. So we're gonna, in this particular group of people, we're gonna use that um, type of exercise, but in shorter durations. Um, so in a normal fed state, meaning that you have, you know, you're well fed, you're well hydrated, your electrolyte balance is good, the energy sources for exercises um, change. So the chart below is a nice representation. It's not perfect, but it's an, a good representation of how our body sources the energy that we need for the exercises that we're asking it to do. Um, really, honestly, the first few moments of any exercise, you're going to be using some free, free flowing blood glucose levels that um, will get quickly depleted, but never completely gone. And after that, within a few moments of your activity, your cells start to decide if you're going through how they're gonna gain their energy. So at low intensity, prolonged activities, the primary source of energy is through the fatty acid metabolism. So you're gonna see that in this first column of the graph. So initially you're using a little bit of that free form glucose. You're gonna really use your fatty acids um, and break it down with oxygen um, as it's, aerobic, but see how it changes. And once you get to the moderate intensity exercises, so muscles are gonna, again, utilize that free food, free glucose in the blood, but then it's gonna also go into your liver glycogen stores and revert to less percentage of fatty acid metabolism, which may come into play for this population and the, the types of exercises that we're gonna choose for you. Um, but then as you see, the maximum intensity exercises is more of that anaerobic metabol metabolism. It breaks down glucose using the muscles, the, the muscle glycogen that you've stored into glucose to get your um, energy. All right, so the big scary thing about exercise and um, patients with fatty acid disorders is rhabdomyolysis. So I know that there's been a lot of talk on this this weekend alone, and I'm sure that many of you are well versed in this. It's a scary thing to be hospitalized for this because it is a complex medical condition involving the rapid dissolution of damaged or injured skeletal muscle. It, re it leads to this direct release of the intracellular muscular components into the bloodstream and extracellular uh, spaces, and that creatine kinase being the, one of the biggest um, things that you see that large jump in creatine kinase um, elevation in your blood, the myoglobins, and some of the liver enzymes and electrolyte imbalances that come with this. Now, what are the causes of rhabdo? Well, um, there's many actually. So you can have you can you can have an episode of rhabdomyolysis from direct trauma, drugs and toxins, infections, muscle ischemia. You can have it from electrolyte metabolic disorders, genetic disorders, as we know. And the type that I've been most familiar with is the exertional um, cause of rhabdo or temperature induced states. So I was treating um, army athletes, basically, who were, you know, had 60 pound rocks on. They were um, in Afghanistan and Iraq in 110 degree heat and overdoing it. And they'd come back with these episodes of rhabdo. Um, the effects can be very scary. It can be as simple as asymptomatic illness. You don't even realize that you have a rhabdo with you just have elevation in your CK level in your bloods, or it can be life threatening. And if you have extreme elevations and electrolyte imbalances, it can lead to acute renal failure and issues that are pretty significant. Rhabdo is mostly exhibited by a triad of symptoms, which is muscle pain, myalgias, weakness, 
And again, some of those um, myoglobins in your urine and elevation in your CK levels in your blood. So those are all things that might bring you to the doctor when you're having, when you, you might not know that that you have rhabdo, but at this, um, this, this triad of symptoms is, is the reason that people would start to suspect something like that. Now, in those severe cases, you're not coming to a physical therapist. You're getting treated. You're man the physicians are hospitalizing you, managing airway, breathing, circulation. And primarily, they're doing things like preserving that renal function because of that. They are doing a vigorous rehydration, IV fluids, making sure your electrolytes are all good and well. And once that gets under control, you may come to see somebody like me. So some of the considerations that are a little bit scary for patients with fatty acid oxidation disorders and other mitochondrial disorders is you have less control over the fact that rhabdo is possibly going to happen because of the air, airs in your metabolism, creating issues with the energy production that causes some of these uh, mortality and morbidity issues. Obviously, the significant health risks um, include cardiomyopathies and hypoglycemia, some liver disorders, and this episodic rhabdo, which is a little bit scary and significant renal damage. So we don't want that to happen. Um, interestingly, that most of the patients that don't realize they have some of the fatty acid, uh, acid oxidation disorders or they haven't presented with it, they typically present with rhabdo um, when they're diagnosed. The children, obviously, who have um, had the screenings and know ahead of time don't present. Uh, they, you know, like we we know this is going to be one of the things that they could they could have. So, all right. So we're going to talk a little bit about the difference um, the differences associated with metabolic disease and rhabdo. I liked this um, graph because it kind of discussed some of the ways the typical triggers for the different types of metabolic disease that you have. Um, so in the top line there, you see if your metabolic issue is with your glycogen storage and you have a dis disorder in that, your triggers actually are more related to intense exercise or isometric activity. So that would be something that we would definitely want to avoid when um, you're choosing exercise types. You don't want that super vigorous, intense activities because that can set you into an episode of rhabdo. Whereas down here where it talks about fatty acid oxidation disorders and mitochondrial disorders, they often are triggered from other prolonged, whoops, sorry about that, um, prolonged submaximal activities or primarily in the setting of fever, fasting, or illness. So these submaximal activities, that's what makes it a little bit so scary. You don't realize it's, it's not a hard activity, but you've maybe done it too long. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when we talk about exercise and physical therapy and rhabdo episodes. So I'd like to propose that it's not necessarily the fact that, you know, rhabdo is a side effect. You could have these issues. It's really more we want to think about is it exercise intolerance versus the specific type of exercise that you might be intolerating. So um, maybe low exercise is fine as long as you're doing an amount, uh, you know, a good amount of time and not taking it beyond the point that you're feeling fatigued. Moderate levels obviously have been shown for safe and recommended. Um, it's been shown to be safe and recommended to do this moderate level of activity. Again, watching time, making sure you're not pushing past the point of fatigue. The vigorous intense activities are only recommended Professionally, I would say they're only recommended for short durations. Again, for that same reason, you're breaking down the muscle tissue to get your energy and breaking down muscle tissue can lead to some of this dissolution into the, the cellular, intracellular spaces that can cause rhabdo. Um, but most importantly, you want to make sure that your energy source is in place prior to exercise. So you want to ensure you are well hydrated, you have eaten, you're following all of your um, your physician's recommendations and your, your nutritionist recommendations, you're taking any supplements you need prior to exercise. And primarily you want to be very body aware and avoid too much exercise during periods of illness. During these periods of illness, you'll find your body's already stressed, already trying to um, you know, heal itself from the illness. And if you exercise, it can push it over the edge and really cause a lot of um, unexpected damage, thinking that you're not overdoing it, but you are. But in reality, there's really no difference. When a patient has rhabdo, a patient has rhabdo. And we are, our goal is to help get you back to that healthy state. 
So ideally, all these same things, I would make sure that any patient, regardless of whether they have a fatty acid oxidation disorder or not, if they are in a state of rhabdo, we're going to make sure that we're giving them the right, right type of exercise. We're giving them um, that they are well uh, hydrated and have food and we're not exercising too much during periods of stress. So there's always going to be a risk and reward when we're talking about any type of um, medical issue. So endurance training we know is super important. It counteracts adverse phys physiological um, effects of deconditioning. We don't want to be deconditioned. We don't want to have fatty deposits in our muscles. We want to have a healthy heart. So all of that's important. Um, it also helps lessen your disease process by increasing mitochondrial biogenesis. So every time you exercise and ask your muscle to do more, it's going to induce more muscle satellite cells. It's going to in increase the mitochondrial activity. But if done wrong, the risk is that you can actually put yourself into an episode of rhabdo. Um, but remember, the reward of this is that you are, if you are healthy, you have, and you're doing healthy activities, you have improved your cardiovascular health, you've improved your muscular, muscular fitness, you've improved your brain health, and you've improved the ability to do your daily life, your quality of life is important. So when I was asked to speak to this, um, I did a bunch of research, obviously, and it's exciting to see all the research that's going on right now. I saw Dr. Vockley's name a lot and Ms., uh, Dr. Gillingham, and um, it's it's exciting to see the, the research that's going into this disease right now. But it's also uh, some of the pre, there's not a lot, really, there's not a lot of research. And I was interested uh, back in 2019, this was published, and they used rice, uh, not rice, uh, mice models, <laughs> um, mice with mitochondrial disorders. And it was interesting to see that they actually showed cellular changes in the, and they took these um, mice through some aerobic and resistance extra exercises. They showed increased aerobic fitness and increased muscular strength. But really importantly is they showed improvements in the signaling pathways involved in the muscle mitochondrial biogenesis. So ideally this is crossing over to the human models. We are doing exercise and, and resisted um, exercise and aerobic exercise can help mitochondrial biogenesis, can help the muscle strength, can help your aerobic fitness, despite the fact that you have these disorders. So having said all that, that was a big, uh, you know, again, a fire hose of information. But I do believe that there is a place for physical activity and exercise for patients with mitochondrial disorders and fatty acid oxidation disorders. I don't like to hear the, my patient come to me and say, people in my community are afraid to exercise because of rhabdo, or they're afraid to come to a physical therapist because they don't want to put themselves in an, in, um, an episode of rhabdo. So I propose to you that, you know, the physical therapist is really where you should be because our knowledge is muscles and bones and nerves and movement specialists. And we, we are here, we have that knowledge to help. We have that ability to work with your physician to help keep you safe and ultimately give you a better quality of life. So again, awareness of the energy source is gonna be super important. Awareness of the type of exercise that we prescribe. Again, I wanna stress that high intensity exercise is great, but you don't wanna do it for a prolonged amount of time. You wanna do it in short bouts of time. If you do it too long, you are going to increase your risk of rhabdo, which we don't want. So we have to be smart about it. So I want to talk a little bit about today, now that we've gone through some of the science of um, where I'm at here as a physical therapist and treating patients with rhabdomyolysis, um, I'm going to kind of give you an overview of the, the reason that I'm here. I received a call two or three years ago about a patient who had very long chain um, fatty acid disorder from her physician saying, I have a patient, do you have anybody in your clinic who has experience treating patients with rhabdo? And I am the clinical supervisor of, you know, a large group of PTs, 17 of us. And honestly, I was the person who had the most um, experience with rhabdo because of my previous experience of the exertional rhabdo that the soldiers I would treat with that would come back from Iraq and Afghanistan with rhabdo. So I talked to her about what um, the specifics about this patient of mine. Anyways, I took the patient on. She's wonderful. She came to me the first time after an episode of illness resulting in rhabdo. So she had been hospitalized 
Her CK levels were really high, but she was out of the hospital and ready to, you know, like get back to life. She came to me with symptoms of tightness, generalized achiness, pain. Her, she felt heavy. Everything hurt to move. And the body's normal response to hurt to move is to be still. But the problem is if you're still, you're not utilizing the systems of your body the best to help your pain. So being quite aware uh, of her disorder, I gave her, some, uh, you know, we started off with some gentle stretching and some range of motion. We moved to moderate intensity exercises in short bouts. Um, we this at this during this first phase where I talked to her, we didn't really do a lot of high intensity exercise. So at that time, I was treating her for as a direct result of her chronic condition. She did great. Moved on, came back to me a few months later. As for the other reason, patients come to see a physical therapist. Guess what? She hurt her ankle had nothing to do with being, you know, a, a VLCAD patient and um, having an episode of rhabdo. No, she, she hurt her ankle. So again, keeping the awareness of her issue, we were able to still strengthen, stretch, work on balance and all of these things to get her back to doing her exercises. Now, I've seen this patient multiple times. She comes back to me because we get her better and things are great for a long time. But guess what? She had another episode of illness resulting in rhabdo in the fall one year, in the autumn. So at that time, her symptoms were a little bit different. She was really having more postural pain. She still had the same heaviness that she described. It was more like a tightness and heaviness. We reviewed her exercise program. We treated her postural impairments with some quid core strengthening. And then we started, I started talking to her about making sure that she is aware, which I'm sure that all the physicians and she is already doing, but we talked about the pattern. When is she ill? Making sure she doesn't overdo it during this time. She happens to find that in the fall, she seems to get an illness or maybe it's allergies or maybe whatever, whatever sets her into this thing. I want her to be aware of this pattern of realizing when she is not feeling the greatest and definitely not overdoing it at that time, because that could lead to that big rhabdo episode where she has to be hospitalized again. So at that third time, we talked about things like watching the patterns, making sure that we're pacing ourselves. And I'd like to report it's very great. All three episodes of PT, we resolved her pain. During physical therapy, there was no increase in her CK or rhabdo symptoms. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Things kept coming down. And she was able to return to her activities of daily, of daily living without symptoms. So I was able to issue her this great home program with a combination of stretching and strengthening ideas for cardio. Ideally, you want to do or you want your children to do things that you enjoy. You want to continue this as an independently of me. I want you to I want to teach you and send you on your way and come back to me when you need me. But I want this to be a part of your life and part of your lifestyle because it keeps you healthy improves your quality of life. And she has been able to participate in these home exercise program for physical health without rhabdo episodes related to the exercise. So that's super encouraging. And, I, and I'd encourage you um, to keep that in mind, not be afraid of exercise, not be afraid of the physical therapist. Exercise is great for everyone. So cardio, obviously we know that's good for your heart and your muscle health. It increases the number of mitochondria in your muscle, improves your muscle's ability to work, improves your body, the way that your body re re gets, its gets its energy out of its muscles. Strengthening helps the muscles store more glucose. It gives you more um, ability to utilize that glucose. And if you're strengthening on a regular basis, you're growing and maintaining lean muscle mass, which is super important in generalized body health. One of the things that we often say in um, physical therapy is motion is lotion. And this is one of the things that made me think when I first started treating patients with rhabdo is they'd come to me with this heavy interstitial tightness. Muscle movement helps the fluids in your body get returned back into the system and taken care of. So you need muscle movement to decrease fluid retention and it helps move the lymph in your lymph system. It's the only way that it works. You need to move. So even though your primary, when you're feeling bad, you primarily just wanna be still and hold still and not do anything, good range of motion, easy exercise is an important way to help you get back 
to feeling healthy within reason. Um, just like joint mobilization, moving your joints, keep your joint surfaces healthy, muscle movement helps the body in general. So I would venture to say, find yourself a good physical therapist. We can help you determine the best exercises for you. We can gain, you know, make sure that you do the exercises correctly and that you're not going to put yourself at increased risk because of the type of exercising you're cho you choose to do. We are experts at becoming you know, like looking at exactly what your body needs and what you, you know, you may need a hamstring stretch and this person doesn't, whatever we need. We are going to personalize a program based on your own personal impairments, but super importantly for the families uh, or for people who have this disorder or their children do, you would want to find a physical therapist in your area that's comfortable with treating and accommodating for these disorders, or at least be willing to re-educate themselves and work with the physicians and work with that group um, to learn the intricacies of the disorder and learn how to adapt exercises as needed. But ultimately, you are your own best advocate or your own your child's best advocate. You need to be able to know your limits, read your body, tell when you've done too much, and stop. You need to prepare your body for exercise, follow all the recommendations, hydrate, water, electrolyte, food, glucose, all of that's important. And remember the typing, types of exercises that you're choosing to do um, can lead to, um, you know, like you want to choose correctly. You can do vigorous exercise, but you don't want to do it for prolonged amounts of time. That's going to encourage muscle breakdown for energy. We don't want to do too much of that. We want to do just enough to help build muscle growth. We want to maybe think about when you're doing something submaximal. Remember that chart where it said fatty acid oxidation disorders and, um, you know, they get triggered into rhabdo when they're doing prolonged submaximal activities. For an, so you need to watch your time. You need to supplement. If you're going to be out there, it doesn't mean you can't go out and run a half marathon if you train for it. What it means is you need to make sure that you're reading your body, you're supplementing um, electrolytes and glucose as needed to make sure that you're not overstressing your body and putting yourself into an episode of rhabdo. One of the things I often say is pace yourself. You don't have to do all 30 minutes of your exercise at the same time. You can do some cardio in the morning. You can do strength in the afternoon. You can alternate days. But what I would ultimately recommend is it becomes part of the way that you live. You want to work out 30 to, minutes to an hour every day if you can, five days a week. Take your rest breaks, that's important but make sure you're doing a combination of activities. Make sure you're doing something you enjoy so you stick with it. But ultimately you are your best advocate. You know your limits and you need to, you know, you can feel free to talk to your therapist about that because they're going to, that's gonna be one of the first things they ask is how are you feeling today? How did the exercises that we did last time affect you? Was it too much? because that helps us determine how to prescribe the exercise to our patients. Um, so specifically for uh, this population, fatty acid oxidation disorders and, meta and uh, mitochondrial disorders, it's very important to incorporate some strengthening to, so, you know, like we said, we need to be reasonable with it. We don't wanna overdo it. I often will recommend things like yoga and walking and swimming, things that are lightweight resistance, um, exercise bands, not super heavy weights. Um, if you do want to do some of that heavy lifting again, you can safely if you're doing it in short durations of time. You just need to be um, very aware of all the things associated with your body and how you're fueling it. So again, I, um, want to thank you guys for taking some time to listen to me today. And I hope that I've encouraged you that um, PT is a great place to be. And, you know, uh, in conjunction with your physician, that you can um, be super healthy and continue on, you know, not being afraid of exercise or not being afraid of uh, physical therapy. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Toby. That was a lot of great information. I'm a mom of a mito, 
uh, young adult, and I know that I've worried for him about ex overextending himself, and I picked up a lot of great tips. One question I have for you, um, we have a lot of questions, but one okay. question is, with all of the new electrolyte products that are on the market right now, what, what are your thoughts on those and recommendations for people? There seems to be a swirl of information, and um, what, are your, what do you recommend? Right. I mean, so here's the deal. You, based on your disorder, whether it be mitochondrial or fatty acid oxidation, you're going to have recommendations from your physician and your nutritionist. And what's important is that you have enough. Um, it's not necessarily drinking that electrolyte right before you exercise. It's more about getting, you know, like the having the consistency of good glucose in your system. So yes, when you're exercising, it's good to, you know, like stop at, you know, 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and make sure you replenish. But it's more about that being well hydrated over the entire day, being well hydrated on a consistent basis, being well fed on a consistent basis. So your body has the ability to utilize um, your glucose the best it can while you're asking it to do more than it is. It is important if you're going to do something more than 45 minutes, or I'd even say for people, sometimes I even say 30 minutes. If you're going to be doing something more than 30 minutes, stop and take a drink. You don't need to drink an entire Gatorade for that. But um, if you are feeling fatigued, you have definitely depleted your glucose or your electrolytes or combinate most likely a combination of both. And so um, I think, you know, just being smart about that, make sure that you are, you can use any of the products, but having said that, you know, some of them have straight sugar. Some of them have, you know, they don't have sugar. Is your disorder something that you want to add the straight sugar to or should you avoid that sugar? You don't need the added calories or the added um, sugar. That's going to come from the, I would, I would have to say, you know, ask your physician or ask your nutritionist about that more. And there are a ton of choices. So, you know, I, I don't have a strong recommendation one way or the other. It's just making sure that you are generally well fed and well hydrated. That is great nice. advice. And I think a lot of, um, what happens like in our family is we start out maybe a little bit on the depleted side and then we just get into a deeper hole. So that was right. uh, good advice. Um, another question we have from our uh, community is, are the muscles destroyed through rhabdo replaced with muscle cells or something else? Hmm. Hmm. So muscles are, they're injured through rhabdo. It doesn't necessarily mean they're destroyed. And actually any strengthening is breaking down muscle. The fibers, when you strengthen, get dam damaged, right? And they repl replace themselves with muscle. So for the most part, you are rebuilding muscle as, it, as you're healing. Okay. Do you have any tips for getting a 13-year-old girl who is tired and nauseous to exercise? Are there fun exercise videos, jujitsu? Jiu How can I help to get her motivated to be, get out of bed? Right. I'm going to tell you, the. Uh, I have a teenager myself. <laughs> I've got two young, and I've got one 11-year-old who is completely self-motivated and will get up and do everything, and the other is not so much. The best thing that you can do for teens is to find something that they're interested in. What is it? Is it music and they, they exercise better when they have their music with them? Or is it they love this class, they want to do yoga, they want to dance? It doesn't have to be a specific type of, you don't need to send your teenager to a CrossFit class, or maybe they enjoy that. And you give them the advice of, you know, keep keep the intensity down a little bit, do the activities. What, what they enjoy, they're going to stick with. If you have to force it on them, they're not going to make it part of their life. So, you know, just delve in, be honest with these kids. Say, hey, this is really important to your health. What is it? So what is something that you think that you want to try? Maybe it's something new. Maybe it's not. Maybe you take them to the pool and it's not necessarily swimming laps. But guess what? They're in the pool having fun or they're at the pond, at the local pond, swimming, they're moving, they're exercising. It doesn't have to be a formal exercise to be exercise, especially for kids and teenagers and especially little ones. Just playing is enough. That's, that's an excellent point to remember that for the young people, it doesn't have to be a formal exercise, just 
just getting out there and moving is sometimes adequate and will spark that joy of finding what they do want to do. So that's that's good advice. Right. So we have another question. My 31 year old son has severe chest muscle weakness and diaphragm weakness. What would you suggest for increasing the strength in those muscles? That's a great question. So um, especially chest, diaphragm, those muscles are hugely important in your core strength. So um, I would actually recommend that you find a therapist who, who does a lot of um, a postural muscle exercise. There's a, there's a great amount of research and exercise having to do with breathing, knowing when to breathe when you exercise, how to use your diaphragm properly, and to work on core because your core and your diaphragm are hand in hand. They're part of the same thing. So um, not necessarily, you know, like working on, biceps or legs, you really need some good core exercises that work multiple, multiple joints at the same time, multiple body parts, you can do some body weight activities, planking, things like that. But when you have weakness in your chest and diaphragm, you really need to know when to breathe when you exercise, it's going to improve your strength and improve your um, ability to perform the exercise correctly. Wow, that what about using some of the um recovery type products that we see a lot of the athletes using like the compression garments. Are those helpful in these situations for, for core strength or core stability? Those are not necessarily a core strength type of thing. Some of those compression garments they're using is more for that interstitial fluid that you get built up just because you're exercising. So that's going to help get the flu. It's going to get fluid back into the lymph system and back into your body and get broken down. Um, a lot of uh, heavy exercise, say you're running a lot and you, you know, you're in a, your legs are constantly in a dependent position and you've done so much work that a lot of fluids pooling down to your legs, those compression garments help get that back into your system. So it's not necessarily going to help you with strengthening. It helps with the recovery of the after effects of exercise and what happens to the muscles at that time. All right. Do patients with rhabdo form trigger points? Is there a danger in messaging the muscles after rab rhabdo? Massaging. Um, Massaging. Yeah, no. So yes, everybody's going to find a trigger point now and then. It doesn't matter whether you have a disorder or not. I've got a nice one right here in my, my upper trap. Um, as long as you're doing some gentle massage and trigger point release to that, you shouldn't, that is not enough to cause a rhabdo episode that's going to just help. Um, well, if you were doing a trigger point release, what, what that is, is you actually kind of hold that muscle. And what it is, is it's a biofeedback to the brain. What your body is reading is pain, 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 pain. I don't like you touching that muscle. It sends a message to the brain that says, relax that muscle. And so you'll kind of feel that trigger point melt after that point. So you're not causing damage to it by holding it and doing gentle massage on it. You're actually getting a release of the muscle by that bio mechanism that goes to your brain. So you, you should be fine with that as long as you're not doing some big physical beating up of your muscles. After an episode of rhabdo and CKs are decreasing, how long should you wait before seeing your physical therapist? I would completely rely on what the physician says. It depends on if you've been hospitalized for that or if you're just waiting for your rhabdo to come down. I've treated patients with very elevated CK, um, but they are not symptomatic to the point they're causing, you know, they're causing some renal damage, obviously. They're to the point where their body is in its healing process, but I completely defer to the physician approving them coming in before. Okay. I think everybody's a little different on that too. So, you know, you know somebody at 5,000 CK is going to react differently than another. So like all good uh, Mito and FAOD patients, everyone is totally unique. <laughs> yes. My 21 year old with CPT2 used to swim 45 minutes twice a day. Since having a long COVID almost a year has been post exertion malaise, rhabdos uh. easily, what would you suggest? Yeah, that's really tough. Um, so COVID is definitely throwing interesting um, symptoms into everybody. And I'm actually, I, we've been treating a lot of post COVID patients as well. So people that have other disorders as well, these long haulers are having issues with endurance. 
And so the way that we train endurance is very, you know, you have to be very careful. Number one, if they're feeling the malaise and fatigue and make, again, making sure that you're well hydrated, you're, you're prepping your body, not just right before the activity, but the weeks, you know, every day you're staying well hydrated and well fed. Um, but I would say that don't think that you can go straight back to 45 minutes of swimming. When you do true endurance training, you want to increase at a, a very slow rate. Typically, we would say, you know, go out for what you can do. Maybe it's 10 minutes, okay? And when you can do 10 minutes successfully two or three times without feeling that fatigue, you can increase 10%. So guess what? Next time, you go out and you do 11 minutes. You don't try to hit that 20 minutes. You don't double it. In order to truly allow your muscles time to improve endurance, you're going to increase at a small percentage. So being patient with that, that's really hard, especially for a 21-year-old. That is, that's hard for me. That's hard for anybody. I want to get up and, you know, I can do this. I've done it before. You go slow, slow increments. Make sure that you can do the activity two or three times taking a break as needed, you know, two or three times to maybe, maybe you say 10 minutes this week is all I'm going to do three days a week, 10 minutes. If I can do that without feeling the fatigue, then I increase 10%. And guess what? That's going to take a little bit of time to get back up to that 45, but it's a safer way to do it and not pushing yourself beyond that point. And you get that true endurance improvement in the muscle. So that's, that's what I would say. Well, that 10% temp- that temp- <laughs> completely goes against the weekend warrior mentality, doesn't it? Oh, 100%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you are stable with your rhabdo, when should you start non-weight-bearing exercise? And can you explain what non-weight-bearing exercises are? Okay. So non-weight-bearing exercises mean you're not actually putting weight. So you can, a non, a weight-bearing exercise would be something that you are doing standing or through your arms, like a plank or squats. Those are weight-bearing exercise. Non-weight-bearing, you're not putting weight on that joint um, as you exercise. Um, We use a combination of both weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing. Actually, weight-bearing exercises improves um, bone health. So we encourage that you always do some sort of weight bearing activity, but non weight bearing activities. So like you want to lift, you want to do a bench press, any of that can happen again. You can start that if you're stable with rhabdo, but I would say that you want to make sure that you're doing it at a low, uh, initially, you don't, if you just have recovered from a rhabdo episode, you want to start fairly low. You want to keep your moderate low to moderate intensity. You don't want to push it and push something heavy, but you can kind of start that again gradually and you can build that. Again, thinking of that endurance that I talked about, you can increase 10% if you're not getting too many symptoms from it. So you can start that right away, non-weight bearing activities as well as weight bearing activities. We'd encourage both. Is swimming considered a non-weight bearing activity? Swimming is considered non-weight bearing. Yep. Uh, but I, I love swimming in the sense that you're using multiple body parts and big, large muscle groups, and it doesn't hurt. You take your body weight off. So if in addition to your disorder, maybe you have some arthritic pain, getting in a pool is awesome because you've right then taken away your weight off your joints. You're doing a non-weight-bearing activity. If you're walking in the water, it's considered weight-bearing, which is another great thing, I would say, because then you're lessening the amount of weight through those joints that are sore. But swimming and water exercises are amazing. Okay, that's good to know. How many pounds would you use in a set of free weights? Well, that is completely dependent on the person's ability. And that's where you would need to find your physical therapist. Or, um, you know, there's some great trainers out there, too. I'm not saying that you can't see a trainer. But if you have zero idea of how much weight you should lift, then you should probably see a physical therapist to help guide you. It's going to be completely dependent on your own strength that you start with. It's going to be dependent on your goals. Um, it's and dependent on you. Are you a are you a one hundred pound teenager or are you a one hundred and fifty pound male? You know, like there, you, you can't just say how many pounds. But I will say that anything 
if you put even a one pound weight or your water bottle in your arm, that's more than asking your body to do just movement. So even a light weight of one to five pounds is strengthening. So I would never start anybody with anything strong. Let's put it that way. All right. So what do you say when your patients come in with uh, no pain, no gain type mentality and they just want to just go all out and you can see that this person really needs to jump back a few paces and then progress at that 10% rate, you know, right. a little bit slower. Like what's, what's the advice that you give them so that they are confident that they're moving in the right direction without feeling that they're going nowhere and it's too slow of progress. Right. And that's a big fight because actually as a physical therapist, that's people who don't know about PT, they think pain and torture, PT, and no pain, no gain. And guess what? We're really not about that. We might joke that we are, but it is absolutely against <laughs> what we would stand for. So, um, you know, people just want to be healthy. They just want to do the best they can for themselves. And I applaud that. But when I see patients that are pushing it too hard, especially a patient in this population that has a disorder that it's different. If you are quote unquote, a normal person, and you've pushed your point to the, you push yourself to the point of rhabdo, you can do that. I could do that. I could pick up too much weight and just go. Well, guess what? I don't have an underlying disorder that's going to push me, even put me more at risk, right? Those patients, I just have to tell them, hey, that was stupid. <laughs> but people with, people with disorders that have a reason, they have to be, I will educate, 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 and say, listen, we're going to get you as healthy as we can, but you have to be your best advocate. You have to understand your limits. You have to understand that you have a, dis a disorder that is going to put you at risk, that we need to be smart about this. And that's my advice. I would just step them back and say, this is why we're doing this. Here's your disorder. Here's what we know. Here's the exercises we can put together. Here's what you tolerate. Let's make sure we're making progress without taking too many steps back. I like that. Would you recommend focusing on building type 2 muscle versus working type 1 muscle in a patient that has had many episodes of rhabdo? that has apparently damaged the larger type one muscle. Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, I, I, the type, the types of muscles, the slow twitch fibers, the, the fast twitch fibers, every muscle in your body has a combination of them. Okay. So when you've damaged some of them, you obviously um, have pushed that beyond where, you know, what hmm, it's not a good thing, but strengthening helps rebuild muscle, right? And so when you strengthen, again, I would say it depends on what your goal is. Are you trying to be a sprinter or are you trying to, you know, walk or are you trying to swim? Um, you want to train what you're asking your body to do. Typically for just general health, we train both. We do a little bit of, you know, anaerobic strong activities at a short duration, especially for this population. And then a lot more of the moderate intensity, you know, like slower twitch fibers that give you endurance through the day. So that's a, that's a tough question to ask, mm -hmm. answer. And that, uh, that might have been a little wishy-washy, but I think we would need to train both. I agree with that. Well, I think we're getting ready to uh, close out today. I want to thank you so much for all this information. Um, it was a great add on to yesterday's conversation of learning about exercise. And like I said, I'm a mom of a mito kid. So I'm going to definitely be implementing quite a few of your strategies that you uh, just recently spoke about. So thank, thank you again. You. And if anybody has any other questions, feel free to put them in our Q&A section and we will try to get answers back to you uh, throughout the day.